This will be the first of two studies on the Holy Spirit. This one's going to um, talk sort of more in general about the work of the Holy Spirit. Next week's lesson will talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in, in the church. So um, uh, we're going to kind of break it down into those two sections. So, why don't we begin with prayer. Lord Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have gathered us around your word. And we pray that you would bless this time that you have given us, that you would send your spirit to be our teacher, that we may better know you. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier. Um, this is the third article of the Apostles' Creed. And we'll start by looking at our law gospel focus. So, Mike, would you read that, please? Oh, sure. All right. Um, John? By nature, all people are spiritually <clears throat> dead. We reject God's word and are unable to receive his gift of salvation in Christ. But the Holy Spirit works through the gospel and sacraments to bring us to and keep us in faith. As a sanctifier, the Spirit creates saving faith in our hearts and establishes us in the new life. So this is going to kind of tie in pretty well with, with some of the things that we've been talking about in, in sermons the last few weeks and in our Wednesday night Bible class as we've been talking about um, a little bit about the work of the Holy Spirit and His work in our lives of sanctification. Um, of course, we... As we're going to study in here, we recognize that um, there's nothing good that we can do without the Holy Spirit working in and through us, um, as, as Luther also points out in his explanation here. Um, here's this little uh, introduction, um, and that's the question, I can. In the first century B.C., the Roman poet <laughs> Virgil wrote, they are able who, who think they are able. Uh, at the beginning of 1998, Nike released uh, a new company slogan, I can. Human beings have always relied on their ability, ingenuity, and resources to meet the challenges of life and to open doors to success. For some people, nothing is beyond our scope and power. In his catechisms, Luther points to God's grace and gift as our only hope for salvation. So in connection with that, and to kind of get us thinking before we read some of the sections here of the small and large catechisms, in what sense is a positive attitude an important, essential part of life? Or is it? Keeps us from being crabby. Keeps us from being crabby. That's good. <laughs> you could have the best thing happen to you, and if you have a negative attitude about it... You're right. Good. Keeps you healthy. It does. Yep. Uh, helps us get along with others. Helps us get along with others, yeah. Sure. Be happy. Be happy, yeah. So... You know, we don't want to say. Oh, um, so, but I think we'd all agree that that positive attitude has sort of limits to it. So, um, in your experience, is then uh, what is the limitation to I can? Can't save ourselves. Can't save ourselves. Um, even short of that, sometimes we just can't. <laughs> I can't reach that top shelf. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah, sometimes we just can't. Um, and so, and so, on the one end, you know, a positive attitude is is a good thing, and, and um, you know, I would even say having a having a godly attitude is. <laughs> 
is a godly response to things because you know we want to live a life of thankfulness for all that he's done for us no matter what circumstances we face but just having a positive attitude you know doesn't doesn't make a thing so you know i can't dunk a basketball i know it's surprising i i know you're surprised can't do it <laughs> In what ways might I can lead to frustration and despair? You think you can and it doesn't work out the way you can. <laughs> now what? <laughs> yeah. Story of my life, by the way. Uh. <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot of this, this you know, philosophy in the world that's all about this positive thinking and you know this sort of name it claim it sort of philosophy we see this in in theology too um, within the visible church we see a number of churches that try to you know I don't know Joel Osteen I always pick on him because he's such a guy that that we all know who he is and he very much preaches that message of you know it's it's a name it claim it philosophy. If you want to be happy, you know, it starts with what? Thinking happy thoughts. Um, if, uh, you know, you don't want to suffer, what I, I don't know, I guess I don't listen to him as much as, and for good reason. But, um, you know, whatever you want, if, if, if you think about it, you can attain it. Kind of the philosophy of life. The danger, of course, the biggest danger of, of that, other than the frustration and, and the despair that it can lead to when you realize that the world doesn't work that way, that you can't do certain things, is that that kind of preaching and philosophy leads to this idea that I can do something about my salvation. Even if it's the littlest thing, we start to think, I can do it, and that is very, very dangerous because we absolutely cannot. It's 100% God and 0% us that brings us to faith, and really even that, that keeps us in the faith. It's the Holy Spirit working in us. Okay, any, any other thoughts on, on some of that introductory material? All right. So then, let's read it from the small catechism first. Um, he has called me the third article. Um, Kate. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my <coughs> Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day he will raise up me and all the dead, and will give eternal life to me and to all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Okay. So before we, we go ahead and, and start reading um, in the large catechism, let's go through just a couple of slides with, with <coughs> scripture references um, concerning the work of the Holy Spirit and why it's so important to us. So... Since Christ died for all people, why don't all people benefit from what he did? Um, of course, we know John 3.16. Um, oh, I shouldn't change this translation because um, I, I don't like one and only son there. Only begotten son is the better translation. Um, but, uh, you know, some believe the gospel message. Uh, Yes? What's the difference between one and only and only begotten? Only begotten better states the fact that um, there wasn't a time before Jesus was. 
Um, plus, it's just it's just simply a better translation of the Greek word monogenes, um, which means only begotten. So to make it one and only leaves it open for misinterpretation. I mean, I mean, you could read it the right way. It's just not the best. It's I don't know. Maybe it's not that big of a point, but. So begotten means lived forever. Yes. Um, It paints that picture better. Yeah. One and only leaves out the begotten part entirely, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Begotten of the Father from eternity. Right. And then uh, through faith, everyone is a son of God. And if you're one and only son, that leaves everybody else out. Well, true. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, you're right. Um, Yep. All right, so since Christ died for all people, why don't all people benefit from what he did? Um, you know, some believe, of course. Um, we, uh, well, we, won't, we won't read through this section. Um, but some refuse to believe. So we know, we know both of those cases. Um, why doesn't everyone just naturally believe in Jesus then? This is where I wanted to get to. Ephesians 2, 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Um, so by, all na by, by nature, of course, all people are spiritually dead. Acts 26, 17 and 18. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So, by nature, people are all spiritually blind. They're in darkness. And darkness is a term especially that, that John uses. He talks about darkness and light, but really all of the, all of the um, scripture writers use that imagery as well. Um, Romans 6, or uh, 8, 6 and 7. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God and does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Um, other translations have enmity with God. So uh, we are enemies of God by nature. So no one can just naturally believe in Jesus because all of us by nature are spiritually dead, blind, and enemies. So how does spiritual blindness keep us from believing? Matthew 13, 14. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. Um, so by nature we don't understand the gospel. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Um, so by nature, we think that the gospel is foolishness. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So our spiritual blindness makes it impossible for us by our own thinking or choosing to believe in Jesus because he tells us what, um, sorry, because what he tells us seems like foolishness. Um, so then how do we come to believe and so receive the benefits of what Jesus did? Therefore I tell you, and this is sort of the key verse in this whole thing, therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 5, 5, And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So only... When God sends the gift of his Holy Spirit into our hearts, can we believe? Um, and, that's, and that's the key point there. All right, so those are, those are some of the scripture references that um, you probably know all of those pretty well, but um, you know, it lays out very clearly in scripture that um, you know, our, our coming to faith is completely the work of the Holy Spirit. So now let's read from the large catechism on the top of page two of your sheet there. Um, and 
Let's see, Jeanette, would you read the first two paragraphs there, please? Those two short ones. But God's Spirit alone is called the Holy Spirit, that is, He who has sanctified and still sanctifies us. For just as the Father is called Creator, and the Son is called Redeemer, so the Holy Spirit, from His work, must be called the Sanctifier, or one who makes holy. But how is such sanctifying done? Answer. The Son receives dominion by which he wins us through his birth, death, and resurrection, and so on. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit causes our sanctification by the following, the communion of saints, or the Christian church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That means he leads us, to, leads us first into his holy congregation, and places us in the bosom of the church. Through the church, he preaches to us and brings us to Christ. Okay, and um, Norman, can you read that, that last paragraph there, please? <clears throat> we'll see how it goes. Okay. <laughs> Neither you nor I could ever know anything about Christ or believe on him and have him for our Lord or lesson were offered to us and granted <clears throat> to our hearts by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. First Corinthians 2, 12, 3, thank you. Galatians 4, 6. The work of redemption is done and accomplished. John 19, 30. 1930. Christ has acquired and gained the treasure, the treasure for us by his suffering, death, resurrection, and so on, Colossians 2, 3. But if the work remained concealed so that no one knew about it, then it would be useless and lost, so that this treasure might not stay buried, but received and God has caused the word to go forth and proclaim. In the word, it has the Holy Spirit bring this treasure home and make it our own. Therefore, sanctifying is just bringing us to Christ so we receive his, its good which we could not get ourselves. Chris Peter 318? Yep. And that's just the reference to the large catechism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, those are the paragraphs that are pulled up from that. Okay. Alright. So how does Luther describe the person and work of the Holy Spirit? Sanctifier. Sanctifier, yep. Yeah. Bringing us to Christ. Bringing us to Christ, yep. Yeah. Of course, is the third person of the Trinity, so he describes him as God, right? That's how, you know, as I mentioned in the sermon today, that's how the Holy Spirit always works. Um, you know, you get into some denominations, the, the more Pentecostal denominations <coughs> that get into, um, well, you know, not just speaking in tongues, but they get into, you know, this thought that the Spirit is revealing things to them um, that are beyond the Scriptures. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, then you've got somebody who, all right, you don't know whether they really heard it or they're just saying they did. Um, and especially if it's something that conflicts with God's word, well, then what do you do? Um, the Lord has given us the scriptures as his unchangeable word, and the Holy Spirit works just through that means. Not that he couldn't work through other means. He could work through visions and through... Um, 
things like that if he wanted to, but then how would we ever have that assurance, that firm foundation? And so the Spirit works through his word to bring us to Christ. That's, that's his work. Um, but it's important to know that he works through his word. Well, I, well, and through the sacraments, of course, too. Through the means of grace. So what does sanctify mean? And how does Luther apply the word sanctify to the work of the Holy Spirit? Thank you so much. Yep, that's what sanctify means. Yeah. Um, separate us from the world. Separate us from the world, yep. Um, so I think of, of it in two ways. Um, to sanctify persons, to bring them to Christ and make them holy through faith in Christ's righteousness, not our own righteousness, of course, but Christ's righteousness. And to sanctify believers, um, that is, to work in their lives through word and sacrament, to bring them to Christ and renew and strengthen them to live as God's redeemed holy people in the world. So, you know, for, for Luther, sanctify includes, you know, it includes justification and sanctification. It includes both of those. Holy Spirit brings us to faith and it keeps us in the faith. And that's, that's what's included in the Spirit's work there of sanctifying us, of sanctification. Any other thoughts on that one? It's just pretty important. You know, I think as a kid, I thought, oh, well, God the Father is the Father, and God the Son is the one that died. And then the Holy Spirit is this extra thing. Um, but That's Holy terrible. No, I think we all did. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, that's, that's the way that most of us grow up there. You don't even understand that part. Right. You yeah. can understand Father, you can understand Son. Yeah. You know... What's that? Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, well, right. Sorry, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's out there somewhere. Well, well, yeah, especially if you were raised in the CLC. Like, you know, well, even if not, if you were raised on the Lutheran hymnal, it's the Holy Ghost most of the time. Sometimes yeah. it's spirit, but, you know. And then ghost even has that, that other picture. Not that it's wrong. I mean, Holy Ghost is fine. I have no problem with the word. But, because you get the same idea from spirit, too. Uh, it's just... But uh, the Holy Spirit's work has been going on throughout <coughs> these, well, the Spirit is always at work, all, uh, of course, but his, his special work um, of, you know, proceeding from the Father and the Son has been ongoing through the whole age of the church. He's sort of the main actor now, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. The, the, the main one who is working on us right now. Because Christ's work is done. He's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and of course the right hand of the Father isn't a physical place, but it's, it's his throne of authority. And, and of course Jesus is still working too. He is he's constantly interceding for us before the Father, but you know he's sitting on the throne, so his work is finished. Um, so it's the Holy Spirit's work now to to bring us to faith through word and sacrament and to keep us in the faith. So yeah, the Holy Spirit's a big deal. Yep. Um, all right. So number six, reason and strength are gifts from God. In what ways are they blessings in life? In what ways are they useless in spiritual matters? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, there's certainly blessings in that. Um, you know, the Lord has given us the ability to, to reason things. Um, and, uh, you know, you can think of all sorts of uses, uses in science and industry, technology, um, you know, medical research, things like that, um, that have worked to, to improve... I don't know, what do, what do you want to say, quality of life here on Earth? Um, yeah, 
Sure. Um, we can build things to make us more comfortable. And sure. Yeah. More enjoyment. Right. So those are good things, and they're all blessings from God too. Um, you know, the Lord is not against us being happy in this world. He doesn't want us to be attached to it. But he's certainly not against us having joy in this world and using our strength and reason that he has given us toward those goals. But in what ways are they useless? They are against God. <laughs> yeah. you can. Our reason by itself is against God. That's right. He can't save us. Can't save us. No, no ability to save us. And you know that's that's what the <coughs> scripture passages pointed pointed out. Um, you know, especially from Romans five, where it talks about us being dead in our trespasses and sin, being enemies of God. Um, you know. Sometimes the reason. Yep. May I interrupt you? Absolutely. Okay. Sometimes our reason gets in the way of of faith. Sure does. You know, and we we can't see it, we can't touch it. And all those things. So our reason says, well, is, is it foolishness? Like, you know, our, this is what our reason will tell us that uh, yeah. the word of God is foolishness. And what we know by the Spirit that it is the power of God. Yeah. There it is. You know, Christ, Christ has won the victory. Um, but it sure doesn't look like it when we look around at the world, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, and, you know, if we, if we are to rely on just our reason and the looks of things now, it would lead us down a very bad path. Um, and, and it gets many denominations into trouble, too, when you're trying to, you know, go into the mysteries of God, things that are beyond our ability to comprehend, um, there are many that try to reason those things out, and then you end up in in doctrinal error. Of, you know that's why that's that's why you get to the place where um, there are some denominations who really do believe that they that they must contribute to their salvation, not because Scripture says it, because it doesn't, but because their reason says, okay, if some people are are saved and others aren't, well. I can't believe that God would just choose some or and and not choose others, though there are some that think that too. But oh, I can't believe that that God would just choose some to be saved and not others. So the difference must not be in God, the difference must be in me. So I must have something to do with it. Even if it's just to accept, right? Well, well I mean that's that's a reasonable argument that um, that many denominations, Baptists and Methodists and you know, anyone on that free will side, the, you know, those are the arguments. That are. <coughs> some people are saved, others aren't, so it must be because some people don't accept Jesus. It's reasonable. But, but it's not what Scripture says. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> A little bit on this uh, spiritually blind, dead and enemies of God. <clears throat> Being enemies of God means you are rebelling against God. Right. Not just sitting there and waiting for something to happen. <clears throat> You're going against <clears throat> God. Right. So there are plenty of people who think that we, you know, are born on this neutral playing field, right? You know, we are, we are neutral, um, and we can either you know, move ourselves toward God or move ourselves away from God. That is not true. We start all the way over here in the enemy camp against God, dead in our trespasses and sin. And dead people don't do a whole lot, by the way. Um, that's why that's why our spiritual condition is described as being dead. To get that point across, that there's absolutely nothing we can do to earn our salvation, except against it. Except against it, right? Right. We can work against it all day long, but ne but never for it. All right. So number seven, then, explain the following descriptions of the spirit's work. Um, 
So called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified, and kept me in the true faith. So this kind of lays out the whole work of the Holy Spirit then. So he's called us by the gospel. Um, it's, it's his work that brings us to faith. Um, he enlightens us with his gifts. That has to do, of course, with uh, his work through the means of grace, the word and sacraments. Um, sanctifying and keeping us in the true faith, again, is his work, too, through the word. Um, so it's there, you know, beginning, middle, end of our faith. Would the second one also be expounding to us more about God's word? So bringing us to faith mm -hmm. is an initial step. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the Spirit works through His word, and he, he, he is ultimately our teacher of His word, too. You know, that's why we pray that the Holy Spirit would be present with us in a Bible class so that, you know, He would indeed be our teacher. Um, because he's the one that's going to make the, the, the scriptures clear to us. <coughs> All right, number eight then, in what sense, according to Luther, is the work of Christ finished? And how does Christ's work continue today? I think I already talked about this one a little bit. Sydney, you break on Yeah, <laughs> more than just a little bit. Um, yeah, um, <coughs> that's. That's an important point, um, and uh, it comes out in, in the gospel reading for, for uh, next Sunday from Mark 16, I think it's the verse 19, where um, in Mark's very quick description um, at the end there where, where he describes Jesus uh, appearing to, to um, the women and, and, and the disciples and then, and then his ascension, it's Mark that says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And it's important, you know, imagery that he's seated there because that's, that shows that his work is finished. Um, there's the reference above in the large catechism to John 19.30. It's those words from the cross, it is finished. Um, and, you know, he meant what he said there, of course. The work of salvation was finished right there on the cross. Um, his work does continue today, of course, as I mentioned, through his intercession um, at the right hand of God. So we can go to Hebrews 10.25 as an example of that. Um, where he always lives to intercede for us before the Father. Um, so that's Christ's work for us now. Alright, number nine, on the next page. How do you know that the Holy Spirit has been at work in your life? How do you know his work is continuing in your life even now? I believe. Right. <coughs> yeah. Yep, that's, that's exactly the answer. The fact that you believe is the proof that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. Because if he wasn't, you wouldn't believe. Alright, number ten then. Describe how a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus lives the sanctified life in response to the first article and the second article. So what was the first article about? Yep. Yeah, God our Father. Yep. So um, how does a child of God by faith in Christ live a sanctified life in response to God the Father, or in response to that first article about him being our creator? He accepts him as our Father and yep. our creator. Yeah. Kind of takes you back, kind of to the first commandment too. That mm -hmm. that love, honor, trust, you know, etc. That's that's how we do that. Uh, what about in response to the second article? So Christ's work, of course, is is that work of redeemer. Well, we believe in knowing that we've been redeemed. Yeah. To be thankful for that. Yep, thankful for our redemption. Thank and praise for our man. Yep. Okay, and 
then how does God send forth and proclaim his word today? How is the Holy Spirit at work in these ways? Well, it continues through the word and sacraments. Mm -hmm. His word is preached and taught. And then, of course, mission work. Mission work, yep. He sends us pastors. Yeah. Yes. Three, three pastors, and in fact, graduated yesterday and are soon to be <coughs> sent out um, among God's people. So, um, you know, and, and, and it wasn't just the, you know, the seminarians, of course, that graduated, but you got the high school and college there, too. So that's, that's um, the, the word being sent forth and proclaimed today through, through that school, because, you know, those, those, those kids that are there are trained in God's word, and then, you know, whether they be pastors who have that job of, of shepherding a particular flock, or whether they be the students who graduated, who take what they've what they've learned, and you know are witnesses of their faith in whatever field of work they undertake, um, that is an example of the Holy Spirit at work, um, proclaiming His message there too. So you know what uh, what we saw yesterday, um, those of us who were able to be there. Um, at, at ILC was really a celebration of the Holy Spirit's continued work. Could we also include here encouraging one another in the faith? Well, of course. Yeah, because how do we encourage one another with the, in the faith? With the Word, right? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly through through the worship service, through through sermons and Bible classes. That's and one to one. And one to one. Sometimes one to one is the most effective way. Maybe oftentimes it's the most effective way. Christian parents bringing their children to be baptized and telling them stories on their knee and yep. it, it goes on uh, absolutely it starts with the individual. And Teaching them how to pray. Yep. Absolutely. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit. All right. So let's go to the next section then. God's secret wisdom. So human reason and strength are worthless in spiritual matters. Uh, on our own, we cannot understand God's truth, and we have no power to believe His promises. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him, St. Paul writes. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. The love of God revealed in Jesus Christ is the mystery of the ages, God's secret wisdom. In the gift of the Holy Spirit, by water and the word, God claims us as his children and creates saving faith in our hearts. The Spirit works in and through the gospel to keep us in Christ. And that was very much the focus of the sermon today. So let's read this section then from the large catechism. Um, Donna, would you read the first paragraph, please? In short, the whole gospel and all the offices of Christianity belong here, which also must be preached and taught without ceasing. God's grace is secured through Christ, and sanctification is wrought by the Holy Spirit through God's word in unity of the Christian church. Yet because of our flesh, which we bear about with us, we are never without sin. Okay, Carmen, the next one, please. Everything, therefore, in the Christian church is ordered toward this goal. We shall, <clears throat> we shall daily receive in the church nothing but the forgiveness of sin through the word and signs to comfort and encourage our consciences as long as we live here. So even though we have sins, the grace of the Holy Spirit does not allow them to harm us. For we are in the Christian church, where there is nothing but continuous, uninterrupted forgiveness of sin. This is because God forgives us, and because we forgive, bear with, and help one another. Okay, uh, Mary? For now, we are only half pure and holy. 
So the Holy Spirit <clears throat> always has some reason to continue his work in us through the word. He must daily administer forgiveness until we reach the life to come. At that time there will be no more forgiveness, but only perfectly pure and holy people. We will be full of godliness and righteousness. Removed and free from sin, death, and all evil in the new, immortal, and glorified body. You see, all this is the Holy Spirit's office and work. He begins and daily increases holiness upon earth through these two things the Christian church and the forgiveness of sin. But in our death, he will accomplish it all together in an instant and will forever preserve us therein by the last two parts of the creed. Yeah. You know, and so that's, you know, the glorious hope, of course, that we have. Um, if you remember from our study in Philippians, uh, Philippians 1.6 um, talk about uh, Paul's confidence that he who began the good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ and that's um, you know that's that's what we look forward to um, that's what the Holy Spirit is guiding us toward So, I should have probably looked ahead before I assigned the reading. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, well, we'll go through the last few questions here. So the whole gospel must be preached and taught without ceasing. What does it mean in your life that you still bear your sinful nature? Still there. Yeah. The old Adam is still there, as as we all know well from, from our own experience. Um, you know, as long as we're in the world, of course, the old Adam is there with us. And you know, our our life of sanctification is a, a life of daily repentance. It's a life of daily recognition that we sin and fall short of the glory of God, and daily going to, you know, turning away from ourselves and turning to Him with that sure confidence in our forgiveness and the fact that salvation is ours. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's what it means to bear with our sinful nature. It's, it's our lives are a life of daily. Repentance. Um, so the Holy Spirit, Luther comments, makes certain that sin does not harm us. Describe how this is true on earth and for eternity. Any thoughts on that one? Well, we have forgiveness. We have forgiveness. Now, in one sense, of course, our sins do harm us, don't they? Um, there might be earthly consequences to our sins. Um, often, in fact, there are. And sometimes those consequences don't go away in our lives. Um, you know, you, um, you're, you're driving drunk someday and you get in an accident and you end up paralyzed for it. Well, the effects of that are there for your whole life. You know, there's no getting rid of it this side of heaven. But where it doesn't harm us, of course, is that there is no sin that is, that is unforgivable, of course, except for that sin of unbelief, as we mentioned. Um, but uh, all sins have been forgiven on the cross. And so, in that sense, there is no sin that harms us for eternity. Earthly consequences, yes. What about the except sin for the against sin of the Holy Ghost? Well, the sin against the Holy Ghost is the sin of unbelief.
Yep. All right, so 14 then, salvation is God's gift from start to finish. How would you respond to these statements? Take the first one first. It's my responsibility to accept the offer. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. It's not possible to accept the gospel. Right. If it was our responsibility, we wouldn't get it done. Right. Yeah. That's right. Same for all the Yeah. It's my responsibility to live as a Christian. Again, <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit working in us that um, allows us to live as Christians and the same thing. It's my responsibility to keep my faith to the end of life. You know, that's the Holy Spirit working through word and sacrament that does that for us. And then describe how word and sacrament comfort and encourage our conscience um, when used on a regular basis. We know we're always in the state of forgiveness. Right. But the sacrament is offered in the office and seals to us forgiveness of sin. It's there, it's been paid for. Right. Yep. And you know, there are there are plenty of times when we <coughs> need comfort and encouragement. That is for sure. Um, and we always have that sure, certain, unchangeable word of God with those sure and certain promises that He gives us of eternal life and salvation in Him, and, um, you know, the Spirit uses those words. I mean, they're the best medicine that we could ever hope to have for whatever ails us. Um, that reminder that the things that we face in this world are temporary, um, and then salvation forever with Him. So we certainly rejoice in those gifts of the, that the Holy Spirit uses. All right, so we're to the end of our time and to the end of another lesson, all in the same week. Um, we will uh, we'll continue talking about the Holy Spirit next time, and then uh, next Sunday will be our last Sunday um, for our Bible class season, um, beginning with the first Sunday in June, and we'll be off from Bible class until our mission festival comes on September 11th. All right, well, let's close with a blessing then. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.